there's a journalistic side to writing novels uh, because you need uh, the facts, you need the information, you need the details. You have to invent off of something. My job isn't to be enraged. My job is what Chekhov said that the job of an artist was, which is the proper presentation of the problem. So I need some reality. I gotta rub two sticks of reality together to get a fire of reality. In a series of novels begun in the mid-90s, Philip Roth took reality and twisted it. What if Roosevelt hadn't become president? But this man had. He crossed from New York to Paris in 33 hours, thus bridging the old world and the new. What if a horrific polio epidemic had swept Roth's hometown of Newark and killed and maimed a generation of children? What if a black professor had pretended he was white? What would happen next? So it's a kind of what-if situation. You walk into something and then somehow or other that's a starting point and that's, that's where you pick up from. Is that right? Well, yes. I count on the um, original ignition to get me started and then one sentence produces the next sentence and that's the way you work. Then something may occur to me, well, what if this happens? So I write down that for later. And I'm sure then you begin to be stimulated by the invention uh, and more invention follows. And if the invention seems silly or preposterous or outlandish, you think, let it sit here, just keep going. Maybe it'll pay off down the way. Roth's engagement with history and the American century began with a moment where a family much like his own feels the impact of events that were changing the world. It was a Tuesday in December 1944. I came home from school and saw some cars. I saw my father's truck. Why is that there? I knew something was wrong. In the house, I saw my father in terrible pain. My mother, hysterical, her hands, her fingers, moaning, screaming, people there already. A man had come to the door. I'm sorry, he said, and gave her the telegram. Missing in action. Another month before the second telegram arrived, the death notice was like losing another brother. The family was finished. I was finished. Morty played clarinet in a dance band in high school. He was a track star, a terrific swimmer. He was great with his hands, the Sabbath digital artfulness that Mickey too would one day exhibit to the world. All their freedom was in their hands. From the shadows of the lost war hero, the brother Morty, comes the unlikely character of Mickey Sabbath, the flawed, mischievous younger brother, the ultimate anti-hero. Mickey Sabbath and Sabbath Theatre, which is such a change from, from where you had been. And I, so I just wondered where that came from. Well, you know, whatever lights the fire under you, you relish, strangely. He gave me great verbal freedom, um, verbal energy. And um, his mind and his thinking and his uh, situation um, produced verbal sparks. I made him into a puppeteer with uh, hand puppets. I see trees of green, red. His trademark was to perform with his fingers. When each is moving purposefully and has a distinctive voice, their power to produce their own reality can astonish people. What a wonderful world. I 
glassy skies of blue. He emerged from behind a screen at the conclusion of a 25-minute show, smiling most wickedly above his close-clipped black chin beard. And I think to myself, a small, ferocious, green-eyed buccaneer from his years at sea, as massive through the chest as a bison. The colors of the rainbow. He had one of those chests you didn't want to get in the way of. A squat man, a sturdy, physical plant, obviously very sexed up and lawless, who didn't give a damn what anybody thought. He's a wicked man, Sabbath. Its hero was distasteful to many. Uh, I found him um, wonderful, and he was like my lucky discovery. Writers, and for that matter, readers, they like wicked characters. Uh, Mickey Sabbat has a narrow moral compass, but he has a huge human compass. And that means that he can do anything and does do anything. He's wild, he's wicked, to use Philip's word. He's inventive, he reinvents himself. He's a magician of sorts. And he seems not to be troubled by conscience. Whenever he spotted an attractive girl amongst the 20 or so students who stopped to watch, he would break off the drama in progress or wind it down and the fingers would start in whispering together. Then the boldest finger, a middle finger, would edge nonchalantly forward and beckon her to approach. After an exchange of polite chit-chat, the finger would begin a serious interrogation, asking if the girl had ever dated a finger, if her family approved of fingers, if she herself could find a finger desirable. And the other hand stealthily began to unbutton her outer garment. Only twice did the fingers undo a brassier catch, and only once did they endeavor to caress the nipples exposed. And it was then that Sabbath was arrested. I was particularly entertained by the descriptions in, uh, in Sabbath theater. This is about uh, Nikki. Climaxes overtook her seemingly from without breaking upon her like a caprice, a hailstorm freakishly exploding in the middle of an August day. Rosanna's, on the other hand, had to be galloped after, like the fox in the hunt. How do you know all this about women, <laughs> about how it works for them? I try to go into things with my eyes open. Drenka dragged herself mournfully beside him, up the steep wooded hillside to the heights where their bathing brook bubbled forth. A respectable woman who was enough of a warrior to challenge his audacity with hers. I will give up all other women. In return, he told her, you must suck off your husband twice a week. Think of how it would excite me, sucking off your husband to please your lover. You want to feel like a real whore? That ought to do it. Stop, she cried out, throwing her hands over his mouth. I have cancer, Mickey. Stop. People have objected to Roth's treatment of his female characters. He's even been described as a misogynist. Philip has been known to love women but he may not always like them. <laughs> and there is a difference. You see, Philip can, he can be very savage. It's not just confined to women, but I think women and feminists have noticed it more the way they have with, let us say, Ernest Hemingway, who was also a great writer. In Sabbath's theater, he has, I think, one of the great heroines of our time, Jarenka Balik. I don't know what more you could want of a woman. Some, some people say she should want less sex than she does. Well, but she does. 
but she's full of life, she's full of humor, she's full of wisdom, she's a hard worker, she runs a hotel with her husband, she's an adulteress, but we've seen that before in great literature, I don't think you can knock her for that. She has a, as hearty a sexual appetite as any male character he's ever given us. She's warm, she's a good mother, and Sabbath loves her. He doesn't just have sex with her every which way, which he does, he loves her, and I think Women might be interested to know this is a 50-something-year-old woman who he's passionately sexually involved with, and he describes her that way. It was supposed to be otherwise, with the musculature everywhere losing its firmness. But even where her skin had gone papery at the low point of her neckline, even that palm-sized diamond of minutely cross-hatched flesh intensified not merely her enduring allure, but his tender feelings for her as well. He was now six short years from 70, what had him grasping at the broadening buttocks as though the tattooist time had ornamented neither of them with its comical festoonery was his knowing inescapably that the game was just about over. Drenka's dying of cancer in a hospital. Uh, she's near the end. Sabbath goes to see her. It's, their affair is a secret, but he goes to the hospital to see her. When, when he knows her husband isn't visiting. And um, she is hallucinating from morphine. And he sees the whole situation, the dra drainage bags, uh, what she looks like. She reminds Sabbath on her deathbed about the time they pissed on each other in a brook. Uh, the brook was in the woods. The woods was a place uh, they went because they could be alone there. And she reminds him while she's dying of this. And she, rem she tells him how she felt when they were doing it. And then she says, how did you feel? And he tells her that really he wasn't as, as good at it as she was. And it's a very touching scene. I think it's as good a deathbed scene as, as I can write, because I found the right wrong topic for them to be talking about. The right wrong topic. Having written Mickey Sabbath, which we've talked about, you then create this character called Swede Level. It's a deeply compassionate portrait of this, of this man, a, very, uh, a, a man who's very, very contrasted to Mickey Sabbath, for instance. Mm -hmm. Where was the what if in this instance? What well, how did I get from one book to the other? Yeah. Well, um, you know, um, you bounce off of the book you've just finished. Uh, you want to escape the book you've just finished um, and do something utterly different. <laughs> Who could have imagined that his life would come apart in this horrible way? A sliver off the comet of the American chaos had come loose and spun all the way out to old Rimrock and him. His great looks, his larger than lifeness, his glory, our sense of his having been exempted from all self-doubt by his heroic role, that all these manly properties had precipitated a political murder made me think of the compelling story of Kennedy. John F. Kennedy, only a decade the Swedes' senior and another privileged son of fortune. Another man of glamour exuding American meaning. Assassinated while still in his mid-forties, just five years before the Swedes' daughter violently protested the Kennedy-Johnson war and blew up her father's life. I thought, but of course, he is our Kennedy. I didn't have any plan beforehand, just sitting down and writing, uh, and beginning with two words. I began with two words, which was Swede Lvov, the name of this character. Once I had those two words, I had hundreds of pages to write. Who is he? What is he? Where does he live? How is, how is he destroyed? 
It was delightful to move from Mickey Sabbath, uh, from the gutter to the high reaches of uh, domesticity. Um, and uh, I wanted to imagine this uh, as decent, um, hardworking, successful, uh, more than successful young man. He struck out. He didn't want to live in the suburbs or in the Jewish suburbs. He wanted to live out beyond that. Uh, he wanted to make a new kind of American life for himself. Uh, he's not a hero. He just was a, a, a decent man. The elevation of Swede Lvov into the household Apollo of the Weequek Jews can best be explained, I think, by the war against the Germans and the Japanese and the fears that it fostered. With the Swede indomitable on the playing field, the meaning and surface of life provided a bizarre, delusionary kind of sustenance. The happy release into a Swedian innocence for those who lived in dread of never seeing their sons or their brothers or their husbands again. So I gave him this daughter and I gave him this wife and I gave him this father, uh, and I gave him this moment of uh, the late 60s and early 70s, uh, and I lit the match. You want to miss America? Well, you got her with a vengeance. She's your daughter. You wanted to be a real American jock, a real American Marine, a real American hotshot with a beautiful Gentile babe on your arm? You long to belong like everybody else in the United States of America? Well, you do now, big boy, thanks to your daughter. The reality of this place is right up in your kisser now. With the help of your daughter, you're as deep in the shit as a man can get. The real American crazy shit. America amok. America amok. I was reflecting something real. Uh, that is, the battles that began to go on in households over the Vietnam War were real. Uh, young people battling with their parents. Uh, young people against the war battling with their parents. Uh, radicalizing their parents in some instances and flying off the handle sometimes themselves. And um, there began to be violence on the left here, anti-war violence, and I, that's what I wrote about. The 60s, from say 1963, the Kennedy assassination, to 1974, I think that's the Nixon resignation. Those years were unlike any years I've ever known in America. They were alive with horror, the horror of the war. They were alive with menace, the menace of the sexual revolution. They were alive with the politics, the resistance to the politics. They were alive with resistance, resistance to authority. Nothing like that had happened before. There were young, college-educated women, some of them just out of college, who resorted to violence to protest the war. This was brand new. The uncanny thing for the writer is the invention of the cast of characters. So all I know is that he, Sweet Little Bob's got a daughter who is gonna blow up, and she's 16 or 17, blow up the post office in this town. But what is she? What is she? Uh, she just can't be a bomb thrower. What does she say, do, how does she act? Meredith Lavov, Seymour's daughter. The Rimrock Bomber was Seymour's daughter. The high school kid who blew up the post office and killed the doctor. The kid who stopped the war in Vietnam by blowing up somebody out mailing a letter at 5 a.m. A doctor on his way to the hospital. Charming child, he said, in a voice that was all contempt and still didn't seem to contain the load of contempt and hatred that he felt. 
Had she not been born into the 1960s, she would have just been a pain in the ass for three or four years and gone on. Maybe to be a pain in the ass for the rest of her life, but she wouldn't have gotten into the trouble she got into. You call it American pastoral, and yet some of the most powerful passages are of the destruction and defilement of the place you loved, your hometown, Newark. Three generations, all of them growing, the working, the saving, the success. Three generations in raptures over America. Three generations of becoming one with the people. And now with the fourth, it had all come to nothing. So what happened? Well, the whole city worked. Everybody was at work, and the city worked. Uh, by the time uh, the 60s came around, there were very few jobs, and the city was not, people were not at work, and that's the beginning of trouble. Had my city remained the way it had been when I knew it as a child, I probably never would have written a book, another book about Newark. I wasn't interested in that uh, placid, harmonious place where I grew up. I loved it, but I couldn't keep writing books about it. And um, I wanted to write about the, the, term, the turmoil. In the city I came from, Newark, which was destroyed in 1967 in a, in a, a wild, uh, arson-laden riot. There was nothing. There was a mattress discolored and waterlogged like a cartoon strip drunk slumped against a pole. The pole still held up a sign telling you what corner you were on. And that's all there was. The last of the cobblestone streets, a pretty old cobblestone street, had been stolen about three weeks after the riots. While the rubble still reeked of smoke where the devastation was the worst, a developer from the suburb had arrived with the crew around 1 a.m., three trucks and some 20 men moving stealthily, and during the night, without a cop to bother them, they dug up the cobblestones. Now they're stealing the streets, his father asked. Newark can't even hold on to its streets. Seymour, get the hell out. I began to be interested again in what I'd taken a crack at in the beginning, but now it's more serious. And also, between the time of my uh, writing Goodbye Columbus and 1989, something colossal and tragic had happened in the city. And I became interested in Newark then as a place that had been a functioning blue-collar hard-working city. And therefore, I had in my mind when I would go over to visit the Newark that was and the Newark that, that now is. I was more, really was being a historian more than a sentimentalist. I think it's, I think American pastoral is as, as deep, a, prof a profoundly psychological novel as you could wish to read, you know, and it, it is kind of extraordinary that Philip was able to do that, to be both the author of American Pastoral and Port Noise Complaint, you know, I mean, the, the, it, it's, it's really hard to believe that the same sensibility could have that range. Seized by FBI agents in a High Sierra hideout, four Communist Party members are arraigned in San Francisco. Two of them are fugitives. Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? It's unfortunate and tragic that I have to teach this committee the That's basic principles of America. Betrayal is a returning theme in Roth's next book, I Married a Communist. As Ira Ringgold's movie star wife, Eve Frayne, writes a best-selling memoir that brands Ira, a successful radio journalist, as a Bolshevik. I married a communist, I slept with a communist, a communist tormented my child. Unsuspectedly, America listened to a communist disguised as a patriot on network radio. A wicked, two-faced villain. The real names of real stars. A big Cold War backdrop. 
Of course, it became a bestseller. And it didn't hurt to name all the other Jewish Bolsheviks affiliated with Irish Shell. I Married a Communist comes next in what becomes a sort of a trilogy. Mm -hmm. You go back in time, you go even deeper back to the 40s. the 40s in America. Well, what, you know, what I would try to do in American Pastoral, in Amer I Married a Communist, and again in The Human Stain, was to personalize the historical. Um, and I wanted to, to bring it home. Um, and uh, the anti-communist uh, crusade in America that began in about 45, I guess I wanted to write about another American crisis that I had known. Russian spies, Russian documents, secret letters, phone calls, hand-delivered messages pouring into the house day and night from communists all over the country, cell meetings in the house and in the secret communist hideaway in the remotest wilds of New Jersey. Lies, I cried, completely crazy lies. But how was I to know for sure? How was anyone? What if the premise to her book was true? Could that possibly be? Following the acclaim of I Married a Communist, Roth was awarded the National Medal of Arts by President Clinton. American Pastoral won the Pulitzer Prize, but Roth was only partway through his American trilogy. I do know as anybody who knew him at all in those years knew that writing was everything that he didn't want to go more than a day or two without writing. I did ask him at one point when he was between books, how long can you go without working on a book? And he said, oh, about two hours. In the 90s, um, when he was working on the American trilogy, um, no, really beginning with Sabbath Theater, which was published in uh, 95, um, he rarely left Connecticut, um, and he rarely saw people, and even his good friends lost track of them. You needed writing, you needed to write, but did you actually enjoy it as a matter of interest? Hey, so it was, it, was, it was, like many jobs, writing is hard work. Um, and sometimes the work was very hard. And um, as with everyone who has to do hard work, it wasn't always pleasurable, especially if you feel you can't do it. And um, that's, that's the hardest part of it, is which, that you don't feel you're up to it. And you've been working at it for 20 or 30 or 40 years, and you're an amateur all over again when you're writing this page. Not just a new book, but every page, you're starting fresh. The other was my own um, capacity to deal with frustration of writing was not as great as it once had been. And you need a great capacity for frustration, because frustration is your daily companion. Uh, your, your, your companion sentence by sentence. But I want to say one thing to the American people. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. I want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. I went to the book called The Human Stain. I wanted to treat the moment we were in America, that was, we were all in collectively, as history. Um, and it was the moment when um, uh, Bill Clinton was uh, accused of, uh, it was impeached uh, over his affair with the White House intern. Um, 
and there was this, the persecuting spirit was alive in America. The situation released, released me. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. In fact, it was wrong. It was the summer in America when the nausea returned, when the joking didn't stop, when the speculation and the theorizing and the hyperbole didn't stop, when the moral obligation to explain to one's children about adult life was abrogated in favor of maintaining in them every illusion about adult life. It was the summer when a president's penis was on everyone's mind and life in all its shameless impurity once again confounded America. Talk about an assailable man, which is more or less the subject of these three books. The assailability of these men who seem so strong, Sweet Lavov and Ira Ringgold and later Coleman Silk and Bill Clinton. The challenge for me was to treat the present as history. The history of the present moment. In the human stain, this persecuting spirit comes to haunt college professor Coleman Silk, who, like Bill Clinton, has told a lie. As with others of Roth's characters, he wants to reinvent himself. You want to be left to be yourself rather well, you than you want to be. be left to be who you want to be. Yeah, not wanting to follow in the tracks of his family or his father or whatever. Well, he doesn't you... want to be black. Simple as that. But he doesn't want to be part of somebody else's we. And he doesn't want to be the we that the they see. So there's the, the, the gigantic pronouns. There's the I, there's the we, which you are a part of, and they want to take you in very quickly. His is the, the Negro we. And then there's the they, the rest of the Americans who say, uh, uh, who have their um, sense of where the black belongs. And so that's what I decided on. This would be one of those pale-skinned blacks who can, as they used to say, pass. And many people passed, tens of thousands, before the civil rights era. And so that's what I decided on. This would be a black American who had the opportunity, as he saw it, because of his pale skin, to pretend he was white. That's what comes of being hand-raised. That's what comes of hanging around all his life with people like us human stain. That's how it is. We leave a stain. We leave a trail. We leave our imprint. Impurity, cruelty, abuse, error, excrement, semen. There's no other way to be here. Nothing to do with disobedience. Nothing to do with grace or salvation or redemption. It's in everyone, indwelling, inherent, defining. The stain that is there before its mark. Coleman Silk is born in about 1925, I think, or 26. And um, he comes to maturity in the 1930s. Uh, the uh, limitations on a black life, or then called a Negro life, were in place, you know. And this young man, mischievous, uh, audacious, playful, thinks he doesn't see the whole future. He thinks, maybe I can get away with this. I'll try it. And so he goes into the Navy and he tries it. And he doesn't get away with it in the Navy entirely. But then when he gets out of the Navy, he can try it again. So he goes down to Greenwich Village to live, and uh, he, try, he tries it on. One evening, she takes him around to a tiny Bleecker Street jewelry shop where the white guy who owns it makes beautiful things out of enamel. Just shopping the street, out looking, but when they leave, she tells Coleman that the guy is black. 
You're wrong, Coleman tells her. He can't be. Don't tell me that I'm wrong, she laughs. You're blind. Another night, she takes him to a bar on Hudson Street. See that one, the smoothie? Him, she says. No, says Coleman. But he's the one laughing now. Maybe there are a dozen more guys like him hanging around Greenwich Village. Not just everybody has that gift. That is, they have it, but in petty ways. They simply lie all the time. They're not secretive in the grand and elaborate way that Coleman is. He's back on the trajectory outward. He's got the elixir of the secret, and it's like being fluent in another language. It's being somewhere that is constantly fresh to you. They, they call it chutzpah. And, and chutzpah? Is that the Negro term for it? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, it is a nice irony, that, that, of course, again, this period, he chooses to be, or you choose him to be Jewish. Well, he chooses to be Jewish for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is, uh, Jews can, can have that very tight, tightly coiled hair uh, that resembles uh, a black African-American hair. He thinks, if I tell him I'm a Jew, I got my hair covered, you know. He's not a traitor to his people, he's mischievous. And he sees if it works. And then at one point, he claims it. And the claiming of it comes with some trouble because he decides he will disown his family, his loving, loving, loving mother. Um, and he has to go to his mother and he realizes he has to have the guts to kill his mother, as it were. As he says about his father, who is an optometrist, who lost his little shop in the Depression, became a, uh, a Pullman porter in the trains. And that he said, the world will take care of murdering my father, it already has. But you've got to murder your own mother. Uh, by which he means he wants absolute freedom from them. I'm never going to know my grandchildren, she said. He prepared himself. The important thing was to let her speak, let her find her fluency, and from the soft streaming of her own words, create for him his apologia. You're never going to let them see me, she said. You're never going to let them know who I am. Mom, you'll tell me. Ma, you'll come to the railroad station in New York and you'll sit on the bench in the waiting room and at 11.25 a.m. I'll walk by with my kids in their Sunday best. That'll be my birthday present five years from now. Sit there, Mom, say nothing, and I'll just walk them slowly by. And you know very well that I'll be there. Reinvention is maybe the great theme of American literature. The self as a creation of the self. You see how it comes out of immigrant literature. People are coming to America from other countries and becoming this new thing, which is American. You know, wh whether they come from, you know, Russia or Italy or Ireland or wherever it may be, you come to America and you become, you reinvent yourself. You become this thing called an American, you know? and. Uh, and so that is one of the great, and every American writer, it's at the heart of American literature. Does he genuinely mean, Philip, as a writer, that, that it's not just through the facts, but through fiction that you can understand your life, that we can understand our lives? That's what great fiction writers do. Of I think he proves it in his books, that it is through great fiction we can understand our lives. Absolutely. You can know these fictional characters and I don't only mean Ross, I mean Madame Bovary, pick whom you will, you can know them better than you know most of your friends. That's what a writer can do. You can trace somebody's life so deeply and reflect upon it how you will. Roth next moved from the reinvention of a single man's history 
to reinventing the history of America itself by putting a Nazi sympathizer in the White House. In 1940, there were people on the extreme right of the Republican Party who wanted to nominate the aviation hero Charles Lindbergh. Um, but nothing ever came of it. I then thought, what if? What if they had nominated Lindbergh? Um, and um, as I imagined it, uh, Lindbergh would have won. Roosevelt was um, going for a third term, which was taboo in American presidency. He was a polio victim. He was a crippled man. And I think if uh, Lindbergh, with all his youth and charm and fame, had run for president in 1940, I think he might well have defeated Roosevelt. And then the White House, a twilight spring evening, shadows falling across the sprawl of lawn, blooming bushes, flowering trees, gracious smiles, quiet laughter. The lean, beloved, handsome president. Beside him, the talented poetess, daring aviatrix, and decorous socialite who is the mother of their murdered child. The loquacious, silver-haired, honored guest. The elegant Nazi spouse in her long satin gown. Welcoming words, witticisms, and the old world gallant steeped in the theatrics of the royal court and looking in his evening clothes like a million bucks, as persuasively civilized a sham as human cunning could devise. I had to imagine two things. I had to imagine the history and the politics that had not, ha that had not happened at that occurred. And I had to imagine who felt this stuff on their backs. You know. What might have made, if it had happened? If it had happened, how, how, would, it, it how, would, it, how would it have affected X, Y, and Z? And who are X, Y, and Z? Who was I going to write about there? And I decided, who better should it happen to but my family? So I was able to imagine the American reality, and I was able to imagine what would my, my, my mother, my father, my brother, and I, and our relatives, and our neighbors, and our family, what would we have done in this situation if we were confronted with this crisis? Um, and I was ignited again. I had two things I had to imagine at the same time, make them work together. Pandemonium, unspeakable delight. Lindbergh had at last stepped onto the garden stage and like someone half demented, my father leaped from the sofa and snapped off the radio just as my mother came back into the living room and asked, who would like something? Alvin, she said, with tears in her eyes, a cup of tea. Her job was to hold our world together as calmly and as sensibly as she could. That was what gave her life fullness, and that was all that she was trying to do. And yet never had any of us seen her rendered so ridiculous by this commonplace maternal ambition. What the hell is going on? My father began to shout. What the hell did he do that for? Did he think that one single Jew is now gonna go out and vote for this anti-Semite because of that stupid lying speech? Has he completely lost his mind? What does this man think he's doing? Koshering Lindbergh, Alvin said. Koshering Lindbergh for the guy. These later epic works were acknowledged to be masterpieces, an astonishing achievement for a writer now in his 70s and for whom things have not come easily. Roth had suffered chronic physical and psychological pain from his 50s onwards. I have a character in, in um, Everyman, a woman who has back pain, and I gave her my despair. And I gave her all my, I gave her all my back pain with it. The long periods of chronic pain are terrible, which in my case was back pain, and, the, and how you become crazed. Because in addition to being crazed by the pain, you're crazed by the drugs, and you want something to help you. And when you find a drug that will help you, you get caught, you get caught. She took the pill, an opiate that killed pain for three or four hours. 
a large white lozenge-shaped pill that caused her to swallow with the anticipation of relief the instant she swallowed it. I do apologize for all this, she said as he was leaving. It's just that pain makes you so alone. And here, the fortitude gave way again and left her sobbing into her hands. It's so shameful. There's nothing shameful about it. You're wrong. You don't know. The dependence, helplessness, the isolation, the dread, it's all so ghastly and shameful. The pain makes you frightened of yourself. The utter otherness of it is awful. I, I don't think that Philip is by nature a depressive person. I think that he has to be ground and ground and ground down by, uh, by pain. Um, I think every man is a masterpiece. Um, I think it is beautifully wrought and elegiac and moving and genuinely wise. I think it's one of the wisest um, meditations on, on human mor mortality. Have I ever thought I lost my magic? Sure, sure, um, sporadically. Certainly between books, it's very easy to think you can't do it again. And then not long after every man came the humbling. I wanted to tell the story about an actor who loses his talent. Uh, it's, called, it's called The Humbling Book. And uh, it was based on a story someone had told me about an actor who did indeed come out on the stage one night and found he couldn't do it. He just couldn't do it. Uh, and it wasn't a stage fright. He'd been doing it well all his life. Uh, and as I said in the first line of that book, he'd lost his magic. That's it. That's the premise of the book. And if a man loses his magic, as this man did, what then happens to him? He tried to occupy the hours doing a hundred seemingly necessary things to prepare. I have to look at the speech again. I have to rest. I have to exercise. I have to look at the speech again. And by the time he got to the theater, he was exhausted and dreading going out there. He would hear the cue coming closer and closer and know that he couldn't do it. He waited for the freedom to begin and the moment to become real. He waited to forget who he was and become the person doing it, but instead he was standing there completely empty, doing the kind of acting you do when you don't know what you're doing. He could not give and he could not withhold. He had no fluidity and he had no reserve. Acting became a night after a night exercise in trying to get away with something. And I wanted him to commit, commit suicide at the end. You wanted him? Yes. I never had a, a suicide in a book of mine, except for a, a woman in um, Everyman. And I wanted to see if I could get a character to that point where it was credible that he would kill himself. What would he have to lose? How would he have to be unbalanced? Where would his equilibrium have to go to get him to that point, a man who had, who had led a very um, engaged and uh, impassioned life. How could he get to this point when he wanted to surrender life? And so my goal was to get there. Have, have you ever in your worst moments, during those moments when you did have a very hard time, has that ever come your way? Suicide? Yeah. Did I think about committing suicide? Uh, sure. Um, uh, out of circumstances. Um, uh, but I haven't done it. So I see. And here we are. <laughs> Finally, it occurred to him to pretend that he was committing suicide in a play. In a play by Chekhov. What could be more fitting? There was a note of eight words found alongside him when his body was discovered on the floor of the attic by the cleaning woman later that week. The fact is, Konstantin Gavrilovich has shot himself. It was the final line spoken in the seagull. 
he brought it off. The well-established stage star, once so widely heralded for his force as an actor, whom in his heyday, people would flock to the theater to see. I think Philip became very interested, for obvious reasons, in the subject of death. You know, and I think just when death is sitting in the room every day, you know, um, you can't, when it's always in the corner, you know, you have to confront it in a way that you don't, you have to confront your own mortality, you know, in a way that you don't when you're a kid starting out, you know. Um, and I think what happened to Philip was that, that he began to understand his own mortality, the fact that, you know, there wasn't that much time and he was this thing, he was the dying animal, you know, and, uh, and it made him look again at his life, but through that lens, you know, through the, through the lens of a mortal being. Saul Bellow's death, William Styron's death, Arthur Miller's death, John Updike's death, Sandy's death, your brother, I mean, your mother's death before all this, but the, the last 10 years of your life have been full of death. Did you spend a lot of time thinking about this and therefore as you thought about it, you began to see scenarios and possibilities and stories? Well, it was the shock, it was the shock of the deaths that prompted these stories. Um, and uh, if you live to be 80, um, you're going to see a lot of people die in the last 20 years of your life. My uh, experience is universal. Everybody dies until you disappear. Um, and so, sure, it marked those last books. It stimulated me. It stimulated me. I wasn't depressed by it. Um, I wanted to write about people dying, what it was like for them, for the people around them. Um, how it came. Um... He imagined that if Alan lay roasting in that box for much longer, the box would somehow ignite and explode, and as though a hand grenade had gone off inside, the boy's remains would come bursting out all over the hearse and the street. Why does polio strike only in the summer? At the cemetery, standing there bareheaded but for his yarmulke, he had to wonder if polio couldn't be caused by the summer sun itself. At midday, in its full overhead onslaught, it seemed to have more than sufficient strength to cripple and kill, and to be rather more likely to do so than a microscopic germ in a hot dog. As Alan's casket was lowered into the ground, as Mrs. Michaels lunged for the grave, crying, no, not my baby. Death revealed itself to him no less powerful than the incessant beating of the sun on his yarmulked head. How did you capture that? It wasn't clearly from memory. How, do you, how did you recall what went on at that time? You mean the polio? Yeah. Uh, well, it was memory. I was... Uh, the Salk vaccine didn't come around until I was in college. And so all the polio, the annual polio uh, anxiety and worry I knew about as a child and as, about a, young, and as a young adult. Um, so this was largely based on my memory of how people worried, what happened when kids died. I wanted to write about this community in crisis. In 1944, there was always polio annually, but there was no epidemic that I knew of. So I invented an epidemic because I wanted to see what happened, you know? Mr. Cantor, the great athlete, still had a withered left arm and useless left hand. And yet on the afternoon near the end of June, running with the javelin aloft, bringing the throwing arm through to release the javelin high over his shoulder and releasing it then like an explosion. He seemed to us invincible. This was the last line in the last book that Philip Roth would write. 
Yet in an interview recorded 10 years ago, he couldn't conceive of a life without writing. If it were taken away from me, I think I would die, probably. And without being overly dramatic, mm -hmm. I, I would be emptied. I don't know what else to do. <laughs> I don't know what else to do. I don't know how else to do anything, he said. I, I don't know how to do anything else. Yeah, I can't do anything else. Otherwise, he said, I just sit idly in this seat without a television and stuff. So you've got one now. Uh, I've been doing it all my life. It would, if it were taken away from me, I think I would die, probably. Without being overly dramatic, I would be emptied. Mm -hmm. So how are you feeling now? I feel great. I was wrong. I was wrong. Um, I had reached the end. There was nothing more for me to, to write about. Uh, I was fearful. Yes, I was fearful that I have nothing to do. I was terrified, in fact. But I, I, knew, there, I knew there was no sense continuing. Uh, I was not going to get any better, and why get worse, you know? Um, and so I set out upon um, uh, the great task of doing nothing. He has turned the key on the door of his creative fictional self. When writers stop writing, it usually ends badly. Drink, the lunatic asylum, depression, <laughs> divorce, lots of things. And I thought at first when Philip, as indeed he did announce it, I thought it was a bravura. I thought he's a bit tired, he's written, and in two years time, he'll be saying to me, guess what, I've started. He has not, and he will not. I've never seen him more content, and I mean it. I've had a very good time over the last uh, three or four years, yeah. Um, for a variety of reasons. I do have things to do. I just don't do that thing anymore. Um, one of the biggest tasks that's come to me is, is working with the biographer, uh, Blake Bailey. And uh, ever since then, I've been in the employ of Blake Bailey. I came by his apartment on the Upper West Side, and he motioned for me to sit down. And he clapped on these enormous horn-rimmed glasses and had this sheaf of paper on which he had written a series of questions. And the first question for me was, why should a Gentile from Oklahoma be my biographer? Um, to, to which I replied, um, I'm not a bisexual alcoholic with an ancient Puritan lineage, but I wrote a biography of John Cheever, which he seemed to accept. And, and it went on for about three hours from there. It was tough. I felt like a club seal at the end of it. He has supplied me with literally thousands of pages of um, typed notes that are addressed directly to me. Um, he has turned over all his personal papers to me. There's a Philip Roth archive at the Library of Congress, um, and that's mostly, not entirely, but mostly a manuscript archive, which you can imagine is, is in itself quite large. But most of his personal papers are up on the third floor of this house in my office. Um, and it will take me years to excavate them entirely. I have uh, miles of files in my basement, in my studio, and so on, in two houses. And file by file, I took the things out and saw what they were, what they were, what they were about and wrote a, a commentary for him. He's absolutely diligent and wonderful. He's interviewed over 100 people in the last year and he has another hundred to go. He just pursues people, and he's, he goes right for the jugular. Uh, so Blake thinks it'll take him till the year 2022, I think he said. And uh, we had talked about this. I said, you know, I'll do anything for you, but I don't know if I can stay alive till 20, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to stay alive till 2020, but don't push me over the top, you know. So he's gonna, it, it'll be published after my death. Philip Roth.
I want to jump now to because I remember the occasion when it happened when Obama gave you the... We got these medals, uh, two groups of people, those who got the medal uh, of the humanities and those who got the medal in the arts. First of all, he is a fan of Portnoy. He's a fan of yours, obviously, a big deal. I think so, yes. But he loved Portnoy. He read Portnoy and he... He spoke about it. How many young people have learned to think uh, by reading the exploits of uh, Portnoy and his complaints? <laughs> and then up on the stage, when he gave you, gave you the medal, he whispered to me when he put it on, he says, you're not, you're not slowing down, are you? I said, I am indeed slowing down. I met him, you know, uh, a few months ago, I mean, like, after he'd stopped him, you know, and, uh, and put the post-it note on the computer saying the battle is over or whatever it said, you know. And, and I think he gave every sign of being somebody who was happy to be released from the ordeal of creation, you know. And, I mean, he's written, I mean, he's written goodness knows he's written, what is it, 34, 35 some books, something like that. And, I mean, it's a lot more than I'm ever going to write. You know, so he's, he's entitled to a rest. You know? and, and if he feels like having the rest of his life off, that's kind of okay with me, you know? I, I, I don't know, I always, I don't know, I wonder, you know? I just wonder. Uh, because I, it seems to me that the writing bug is something which is more or less incurable. You know, you've had your birthday, you've had the acclamation. I mean, many people, most people think you are the greatest living writer, not just the greatest living American writer. Uh, but um, some don't, maybe. Quite a few don't. And, uh, Most of Pakistan doesn't. <laughs> uh, well, maybe that'll change with the <laughs> internet. Now that I don't write, I just want to chatter away. When are you coming back? <laughs> Quite soon. <laughs> you know something? I can guarantee you that this is my last appearance ever on television. Well, I think we'd better put the end credits up now, then, well, say... It's absolutely... Well, an absolutely last one. Absolutely last appearance on any stage anywhere. Bye. Bye-bye.